our Lord is telling us in today's Gospel reading not to store up for ourselves earthly riches, but rather heavenly riches. And when we think about it, you know, most people, how much time do they spend trying to get ahead in the world, trying to uh, acquire worldly goods. You know, think even when it comes to our education. Most of our education is so that people will be able to get a good job. And even sometimes when they get a job, let's say you're a lawyer or, or a doctor, right? You, you have to keep studying so that you can continue with your profession. So in other words, so much time, so much energy goes into securing your place here in this world, trying to ensure that you are able to live a decent life, not just a decent life, but ideally a good life, uh, a life where you, you can live in, in luxury and, and have the things that you want to be able to travel or do all these things. Now, granted, not everybody attains that, but most people desire that. Now compare that to how much time we spend learning about our faith and actually putting our faith into practice, in other words, trying to gain worldly riches. So the requirement of the church is that you come to church on Sundays. Yes, we should also pray on a daily basis. It's not a precept of the church, but it's kind of a given. If we're not praying, then we're really just going through the motions. So we need to pray also. And how much do we pray on a given day? When we pray, when we do good deeds, when we deny ourselves, we are laying up for ourselves earthly treasures. Same as if we make the effort to study the scriptures or to do spiritual reading, maybe study the catechism. All these things help us to ensure that we acquire heavenly riches. Now notice our Lord goes on to talk about the eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. And sometimes when you look into the eyes of someone who's very holy, like a saint, sometimes even in the pictures that we have of them, there's a beautiful sparkle in their eye. And sometimes people who are very evil or wicked, who are full of darkness, their eyes are kind of dull. And this is evidence. So the eye is the window to the soul. But what our Lord is getting at is if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. In other words, notice how he says where your heart is, so where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So in other words, the things that we desire, we often look at those things. We often desire them. Think, for example, of lust. So somebody who's filled with lust, he might look at pornography or might look at people inappropriately. But not just lust, it could be for wealth or, or you know, people who have a fancier car than they do or fancier dress than they do or jewelry. They, they might look at these things and desire them. So it's not just with our physical eyes, but the eyes of our soul. What are the things that we look at? You know, sometimes when we pray, you know, people complain of distractions. And there may be many reasons for those distractions. Sometimes it's things that we need to think about and, and address. But sometimes those distractions are the things that we really love. Sometimes they're kind of like temptations. Our mind wanders to this inappropriate thing or that inappropriate thing because there's some attachment, some desire there. So what are we looking at? What are we striving to accomplish in this world? And when it comes to these treasures, you know, sometimes it's just very worldly things. People might think, oh, well, it's not that sinful. Please turn off your cell phones. Some people might think it's not that, that sinful. But I want to quote to you from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears, their end is destruction, their God is the belly. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. So they're enemies of the cross. They don't like the cross. They don't like suffering. But their God is the belly. And I wanted to talk about the, the sin of gluttony. 
So the sin of gluttony, well, it's one of the seven deadly sins. And sometimes, you know, when we say deadly sins, people think, oh, it's a moral sin. No, the seven deadly sins are often referred to as the capital sins. So in other words, there are these seven sins from which all other sins tend to, to flow from. So gluttony is one of them. And, it, and it's a sin that doesn't often get addressed. So I thought I, I would address it today. So the word gluttony comes from the Latin word for gulp. And of course, it refers to overindulgence or lack of restraint when it comes to food or drink. And of course, when people give in to, to gluttony, there's different ways in which we can commit the sin of gluttony. And most people think it's just overeating. Well, that's just one form of gluttony. But it could be also kind of being too uh, fussy about the kinds of foods you, you eat and, and spending excessively in order just to have the very best quality of food when there's absolutely no need for that. I mean, if it's a special occasion, a celebration, that might be understandable. So being too fussy, too picky, and just wanting things that taste really, really good instead of eating for health reasons, for example. And also, uh, eating at the wrong times. So in other words, eating between meals. Now, you know, sometimes people may need a snack, you know, in, in certain cultures, you know, for example, they have tea time and, and they'll have a little snack at that time. That might be okay, but this is like people who, oh, what am I gonna do? Let, let me open the fridge and maybe I'll snack on something. Or eating before it's time to eat. In other words, let's say everybody's going to have dinner, but you just can't wait and you start eating before everybody else is, is starting to eat also. So being impatient. Or eating too avariciously, too hung, too greedily. Eating too quickly because you just want that, that satisfaction, that, 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 you know, that feeling of, of you know, having food in your stomach. So these are some of the ways in which we can commit the sin of gluttony. And what are the consequences of gluttony? You know, think, for example, especially of overeating, right? When we overeat, it inclines us to be more lazy because all the blood has to go to our stomach to deal with the, the, the meal, and especially if we've had an overly large meal. So it leads to a kind of laziness, a kind of sluggishness, but it also, it means we're lacking in the virtue of temperance. In other words, we just give in to our desire. And if we give in to the desire for food, we're all gonna be more likely to give in to other desires. So gluttony and lust are often very closely interconnected. Somebody who overeats, they're more likely to give in to lust also. But not it could be other sins for other people. So it leads to a kind of laziness, but it also leads to a kind of mental fog because there's not enough blood getting to the brain. And this mental flog fog rather, and, and also this laziness, this lack of accomplishing the things that we should be doing, especially in the spiritual realm, blinds us to spiritual realities also, but it also leads to a kind of hopelessness, which eventually leads to despair. So the more we focus on food as a source of consolation, the less we find consolation in spiritual things also. So it's, it's, it's not a good thing. And when, you know, some people say, oh, well, there's so many people overweight today. And there's many reasons for that. It doesn't mean that everyone who's overweight is a glutton. So some people are more prone to put on weight than, than others. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas apparently was, was very, uh, very large um, and very heavy. And, and some say it's because he fasted and then afterwards his body kind of just accumulated a, a lot more food, even though he wasn't eating a whole lot. So there's different reasons as to why people are overweight. And one of those reasons is also so because today people don't um, exercise as much. And then by exercise, I don't mean just going to the gym. I mean kind of like physical labor. You know, imagine in the olden days, women who had to wash clothing by hand. You know, they had that rack and they would have to, you know, do this. It's a lot of intense work or chopping firewood or women having to go to the well and, and bring buckets of water back into the home. That's very, uh, you know, there's a lot of exertion involved in that. So today, you know, we have so many things at our fingertips, so many conveniences, so we don't exercise as much, which also causes people to gain weight more easily. But what is the antidote to gluttony? Well, basically trying to have self-control. So not eating between meals, not snacking, you know, and, and of course, one of the extreme forms of gluttony is, is drunkenness, so excessive drinking. So a person could be drinking pop or, or juice throughout the day, and that, that is a form of gluttony also. Is there a need for that? 
So yes, we need nourishment, but drink water. There's nothing wrong with drinking water. It's, it's actually good for you. So um, what is the antidote? You know, today is Friday. Friday is a day of abstinence. We abstain from meat. Yes, you could do some other penance, you could substitute, but you know, Holy Mother Church in her wisdom gives us this day of abstinence, which causes us to have greater self-control. Okay, I'm not gonna eat meat today. And of course, fasting. Or you might say, okay, I'm not, I'm gonna eat meat, but I'm not going to eat as much. I'm going to limit my food. Maybe I'll only have one full meal and, and two smaller meals, kind of like a fast day. So there's different things that we could do. So fasting is one of the ways in which we can overcome this inclination to, to gluttony. Now, granted, not everyone is guilty of the sin of gluttony, at least not on a regular basis, but we all sometimes seek the things of this world. And it's important that we acknowledge this. And, and that quotation that I gave you from Philippians, it's Philippians 3.19. So they are enemies of the cross of Christ. If we love the cross of Christ, we must be willing to conform ourselves to the cross of Christ. And as I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, I'm doing a vote of Mass in honor of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And yes, the Sacred Heart manifests to us the love of God, the love of Christ for us, but it's also an invitation for us to imitate the Sacred Heart of Jesus, to suffer as he suffered, to give of ourselves for the sake of others to deny ourselves, instead of overindulging or seeking the things of this world, to give up the things of this world and to give of ourselves. And in today's first reading from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you know, St. Paul, he was being criticized. And so he says, okay, I'm gonna boast a little bit. You know, I know I'm gonna sound foolish, but he's saying, well, he's qualified. He's, he's educated, he's an Israelite, he's all these things, but he worked harder than anyone else. He was imprisoned, he was flogged, he was sometimes near to death. Um, he received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one, five times. 40 lashes minus one, 39 times. There was this law that you could, the Jewish law, that you couldn't flog someone more than 39 times. Because if you did, they were in danger of dying. And they had different instruments for flogging, but uh, you know, when, when the Romans, for example, when they flogged Christ, it was more than 39 times because they weren't uh, bound by this, this law, but the Jewish people were, so five times. You know, imagine how long it would he take for the, for the wounds on his back to, to heal. He was, three times he was beaten with rods, with rods, so that's very painful. Once he was stoned and left for dead, you know, imagine people throwing rocks with all their might at your head, intending to kill you, and imagine the bruises you would have afterwards. Three times he was shipwrecked. For an entire night and a day, he was adrift at sea. And he's not complaining about these things. He's saying he endured all these things for the sake of Christ, for the sake of bringing the message of salvation to others. And then he talks about all the dangers, from, even from his own brethren, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, without food, cold and naked, and all these things. And yet, he doesn't claim, oh, look how strong I am because I endured all these things. No. He says, I boast of my weakness. I can't do anything. I can't preach. But God works through me. God works in my weakness. And this is what we are called to acknowledge, that we can't do it without God. We need God. And we need to overcome our inclinations to the things of this world. We need to overcome our desire to seek happiness in the things of this world. And okay, it might not be gluttony, but we all seek comfort, we all seek peace. We all just wanna be able to put up our feet and read a good book. I'd love to do that. But we need to work for the Lord. We need to discipline ourselves. We need to go out of our way to bring the message of salvation to those around us. Let us reflect on these truths and let us lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven.